As Windows 11, the worst operating system ever, continues to expand like a moss wrestling control away from the user, those who do not wish to tolerate it will soon be left with another harsh question to answer. When support for Windows 10 ends for consumers in October, where will these people go? One option would be to simply stay put. An operating system doesn't suddenly turn into a hellscape after its end of life, and I personally know this from having used Windows 7 as my daily driver without problems all the way up until July 2021. As it turns out, there's still some situations where the continued use of an obsolete version of Windows is necessary to run the software you need to get the job done, especially when you still want to get your money's worth out of it. Either it may not work correctly on later releases of Windows, or said releases basically have malware integrated into them, so in general, Windows 7 is something I'd trust much more than anything which came after it. Thanks to the hard work of endearing masochists, you can go as far as to run Windows 7 even on some modern AM5 systems, with the previous generation lineup of chipsets such as the B650, X670, and X670E giving you better luck. Yes, this aging operating system is still incredibly powerful with the right modifications, something you couldn't even say about Windows 95 when it became possible to run it on Pentium 4 systems in 2010. Even so, installing Windows 7 onto newer computers proves to be an incredibly difficult undertaking, you won't even be able to get started if you use the stock installation DVD as it is, given all new computers drop EHCI compatibility, which is basically USB 2.0, the dominant standard at the time of Windows 7's release. Even if you're lucky enough to have an actual PS2 port, it will never be able to see your NVMe SSD as it is. And that's where remastering comes into play. Essentially, new updates and drivers are integrated into Windows 7 and its pre-installation environment which you would normally load by hand, something which is not possible when you can't use any input devices with the operating system or install it to any storage device which may not be compatible with it. As such, a separate installation of Windows is necessary, and in my case, I just whip up a burner installation of Windows 7 to run the tools I need. In this installation, I load the Windows AIK supplement. Note that I say supplement as this is very important for getting the best results. This particular package comes with WinPE 3.1, which is the environment used in the Windows 7 Service Pack 1 DVDs. What I found is that it has a much better shot at seeing all of the NVMe drives on my computers. Once I get some things loaded, of course. To ensure Windows 7 can use NVMe drives, you'll need to use a tool from the AIK called DISM, which is used to mount a WIM file containing the boot or installation files. It's a very convenient command line utility that can automate the integration of updates and drivers in a few commands. The first packages you'll want to obtain for sure are the NVMe updates for Windows 7, which are KB2990941 and KB3087873 version 2. After that, you'll want to get some drivers for your computer. Most driver vendors haven't officially supported Windows 7 for a long time, but a convenient set of modified drivers for Windows 7 is still being maintained by Canon Kong. This will cover most of the drivers for storage, USB, networking, and audio. It's not a given that every device on your motherboard will work with Windows 7, so you may need to be prepared with some PCI Express expansion cards just in case, like a TP-Link TX401 10 gigabit network card if you need fast local area networking. Onboard 5 gigabit network interfaces look to not be supported yet, but if you've got one rated at 2.5 gigabits, there's a good chance it will work with this set. As far as video cards go, I would personally recommend something from the Radeon 6000 series, which is the last lineup of cards AMD supplied Windows 7 drivers for, as late as 2022. They're still being sold new at some major outlets for reduced prices, so this is probably a golden opportunity to get one. Once you've got what you need, there's a little something you should do. 
you see you could type every command you need to integrate the updates and drivers one by one, but if you go that route, your life is going to be miserable. For that reason, I advise creating a batch script containing the entire sequence of modification commands so you can quickly go back and adjust the procedure if something goes wrong. In this script, I start off by modifying the boot.wim file. It has two indexes, and Microsoft's own documentation suggests updating both of them simultaneously. I use a for loop to go about this without having to repeat several lines of commands. As you should see in the i variable preceded by 2% signs, the loop mounts index 1 and then index 2, following the exact same commands with only that index number being changed for each iteration. The loop mounts the index number of the WIM file, integrates only the NVMe updates, and then integrates the modified driver set. Note the use of the recurse and force unsigned switches. The recurse switch tells the program to run through every subdirectory for drivers to load, and force unsigned allows the integration of unsigned drivers, something which is risky, but necessary because some of the drivers could have been modified, and Microsoft no longer certifies Windows 7 drivers. Following this, the WIM is unmounted with the commit switch, applying the changes to the image. Depending on how you're going to install Windows 7, you may also need to modify the WIM file coming from WinPE 3.1 supplied in the AIK. Use the copy PE command to automate this procedure, and apply the same commands you run on the boot WIM to this one. I find this necessary so as to be able to install Windows from a network share, as even with modified drivers, WinPE's USB support is extremely limited on later boards like X670E, but strangely not Windows 7 itself, at least on the hardware I've been using. Modifying install.wim requires significantly more files to be loaded, mostly the essential updates all the way to 2020, and, if you feel like it, you could integrate your video driver there as well. I advise only updating the index pertaining to the edition of Windows you'll be using, which would be ultimate in my case. In addition to the NVMe updates and the drivers you'll integrate into the boot WIM, the following update packages should be loaded to Windows 7. The servicing stack update from March 2019, the SHA2 update, then the servicing stack update from January 2020, the convenience rollup, and the January 2020 rollup. The order in which these updates are loaded matters a great deal. The servicing stack updates will update the Windows Update program in the distribution, which is required so it knows how to deal with the later update packages. These updates are still available from the official Microsoft Update catalog so it's preferred to download them from there. As the final support plans for select Windows Server 2008 customers will end next year, these could be taken down in due time, so it's best to hoard the updates now while you still can. If you are going to be integrating a Radeon driver, it's only distributed as an executable installer, but you can extract the contents with 7-zip. The display driver files are compressed into their own cabinet archives, so you'll need to decompress them in order to successfully integrate the driver. This can be done with a simple command, expanding all files ending with an underscore into a temporary directory, then moving them back into the source directory. The extracted driver can then be integrated into the install WIM. However, I haven't had much success getting it to automatically load the driver for my RX 6400 video card. I had to load the driver manually by using the standard method. After you have the lines laid out in your script to integrate the updates and drivers you need, you can additionally set a product key to be loaded automatically during the installation procedure with an additional command. I prepended this command with an at symbol so it's not echoed in the script's execution. Lastly, the WIM is to be unmounted. Do keep in mind that DISM can only operate on locally stored WIM files, so if yours resides on the network, 
you'd have to copy them to a local disk. The batch script can be used to copy the WIMs back to the network or any location you'd want when you're done with them. Add the slash Y switch to avoid confirmation prompts when overwriting a file. The next thing you'll need to do is get a spare flash drive. 32 gigabytes is plenty enough. It'll need to be totally wiped, so if there's anything important on it, back up those files. You can run this procedure either on Windows or Linux. The outline of the procedure is that you create one NTFS partition on the drive, set it as active, and copy the appropriate Windows 7 distribution over. If you wish to try installing Windows 7 from the flash drive itself, copy the Windows 7 setup directory with the modified WIMS in place. Otherwise, copy the contents of the ISO directory and the WinPE directory you created to this drive. Don't forget to copy the WinPE WIM file to the sources directory in the destination disk. This file should be called boot.wim. As an extra precaution, all drives besides the one you're going to install Windows to should be disconnected. From here, you can boot the USB drive on the target machine. On AM5 motherboards, I found that the amount of usable USB ports in WinPE is severely limited to as much as only one port. You'll have to find where yours is. Keep moving the connection around until you can input anything with the keyboard or mouse. You might have a better time if you use a USB hub to plug both of them in. I've got one integrated in my monitor. If you still can't get anything to work, you may want to consider getting a PCI Express USB 2.0 card, which can be loaded by Windows 7. This may be a requirement if you plan to install Windows 7 from the flash drive itself. If you copy the entire Windows 7 setup directory, the setup program should load automatically. If you'll be using WinPE instead, you'll be met with a command prompt. That's the route I took as I had no luck with the former method. To install from a network, make sure you have connectivity to it and use the ipconfig command to verify if you have an IP address available. If you cannot or do not want to use DHCP, run this command displayed on screen to set a static IP address. The gateway is intentionally set to the loopback IP address. 127.0.0.1 To mount the network share, type this command net use z colon double backslash server backslash share. Replace server with the name of the server that you are connecting to, which could be an IP address, and replace share with the name of the file share that the server is hosting. Most likely, you'll get a complaint that the password is invalid. You'll be asked to specify a username. You may need to precede it with a domain or workgroup name followed by a backslash. Usually, this will be workgroup, but check your server's workgroup name to be sure. Then, enter the password, and you should expect a message indicating that the share is mounted. Run the setup program from this share and proceed as you would. After selecting the installation drive, the program should run along on its own, rebooting several times until it asks you to assign an initial username and password to your account. You should notice that it will run much faster than if you were to install it from a plain old DVD back in the day. With that, you can load all the software that you need to run on your computer using Windows 7. Extended service updates and other hacks to get updates as late as 2026 are beyond the scope of this video, as I would prefer to find a method to integrate them without having to call up the Windows Update program. Remember, this is about running legacy software you may need with extra power, such things like Adobe CS6. It would be a good idea to take your Windows 7 computer offline just in case. One way you can do this while still having local area networking available is by setting a static IP address with a bogus gateway address. For everything else that you do, just use Linux. Creative software like GIMP and Kden Live have come a long way, and by making an effort to adjust yourself to these programs, 
you may find there's a ton of really impressive stuff you can do in them. When I finally stopped using Windows 7 on my primary computer, Arch Linux is the operating system that I settled on, and all I can say is that it was the first time I felt genuinely excited about computers in many years. But, Arch is not a distribution for everyone. So, if you're a total novice to Linux, my personal recommendation would be Linux Mint. This distribution is designed to be user-friendly from the ground up, and is a shining example of why Linux is for everyone.